kid. Seriously. <laughs> Welcome to an optimistic return of the Star Wars in Review podcast. We're the only podcast who will go the full effort to defend the chill pony in a subway bathroom. Over there, it's Luke Neitzel, who is not completely correct on his understanding of the term ambivalence. And over here, it's Maya Madrid. I got a new job, suckers. Every so often, we get together, discuss the news in the realm of Star Wars, answer some questions that we got from you, and review an episode of the Clone Wars series. Give us a like, give us a subscribe, and whatever you do, don't swim before you wait 45 minutes after a meal. Luke Neitzel, how are you? Huh, I'm ambivalent. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> Touche. What's going on in your life, man? Oh, I had just the dream evening that any person can have where I got to go sit at a elementary school dance for two hours which is better than a middle school dance because there isn't any awkward humping or any of that that you have to either try to ignore or get away from but it, it's two hours of sitting in a cafeteria while multiple games of tag morph together and morph apart so that's what i did today it that was sounds, fun that sounds great i um a couple weeks ago maybe a couple months ago because it was right when the uh, the whole kidney stone thing started you had a segment that said luke made a mistake Mm-hmm. So I would like to redo that that segment, the Luke made a mistake segment, and talk about Avengers: Infinity War because this time it wasn't you, it was me. I made a huge mistake on our last episode. I had seen it once. I saw it at twelve thirty five. Um, I saw it um, really late and with uh, quite a few people who were talking, um, both in front of me and to the side of me. And um, I saw it again, and I really, really enjoyed it. I didn't think it was overstuffed. I just couldn't concentrate the first time and couldn't follow it. I was It was almost like I was drunk. The CGI was fine. It wasn't too dark. I, I think I was focusing in on um, on some of the scenes instead of like looking at it as a whole. And I think when I was going back and thinking about it, I think I, I estimate that I understood about 30% of the dialogue that night. Um, so I loved it, and I'm sorry that I told all our viewers last week that it wasn't good. I was wrong, and I apologize. But there is um, there's some good news about it. Hmm. At the 1235 showing, I was able to meet Dave from Atomic uh, Geekdom, and we talked a bit about podcasts, and he gave me some good advice, and we talked about collaborating in some way, and I listened to their show, and I thought it was awesome. So hello to Dave, uh, if you're listening, and to our listeners, if you get the opportunity, check out Atomic Geekdom. They have everything from pop culture to wrestling podcasts, and they're great. So um, that was one good thing, even though I didn't have that great of experience that night. Awesome. I was really baffled when we were talking about the movie, uh, Yeah, I saw it at 8 o'clock, and... <laughs> I fully grasped it, and then some of the things you were telling me you didn't like, I didn't even know what to say. <laughs> I, I will... just kind of sat there in wide-eyed silence, not really knowing where to go. I will give you credit. Um, you were making facial expressions that I had never seen out of you, <laughs> and which is, it's somewhere past, wow, you're an idiot, because you've given me those facial expressions <laughs> plenty of times. So I give you credit for not just like hauling off and just ripping me and just mocking me. Um, it must have taken a lot of a lot of fortitude. Um, I think I was just too confused. Okay. Because I watched it, and I remember walking out, you know, after I was done thinking about how much fun I had with Jim, I thought about how <laughs> much I thought you were going to... Jim. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about how much I thought you would love that movie. Yeah. So then when you didn't love it coming out of your, your late night showing, I was very thrown off my, my game mentally there on where to go with that. I did. I, I mean, I did love it, and probably for the reasons that, that you thought I would. I thought... It was great, and I encourage everybody to go out and see it. You ready for the news? Let's do it. According to Variety, Solo, a Star Wars story, is tracking for a $170 million opening. If it hits that number, Luke, it'd be the 10th highest opening of all time, though it would have help from the Monday holiday. That mark would put it in the upper echelon of the MCU range and similar openings of recent movies like Beauty and the Beast and the Harry Potter finale. Luke, these numbers do take advantage of that extra day that I mentioned, but they're still pretty impressive if they if it happens. If it hits that number, would it surprise you? And if so, why do you think it's tracking so high? No, I always thought it would be a movie that was going to have a massive opening weekend. I, I don't think you'd say, oh, it's on a holiday, so we're going to take away from what it does. 
they put movies like that on holidays sure. that they think are going to be high I, performers. I just, meant, I just meant that 170 million includes that holiday, so the sure. numbers are a little skewed compared to some of the other ones. So. Sure, but I, I think it's always going to have a big opening because it is a character people love. I think this is a movie you don't have to have seen a lot of other movies to go see and make sense of. And it's a movie that looks like it's going to appeal to a wide variety of ages, which I don't think Rogue One did as much, even though it, I think it still did fine with children. But it, what'll be interesting and what'll be dependent, I think, on how good a movie it is, is the legs it has after that. Because yeah. we've seen other movies that have massive opening weekends and then they die because the word of mouth is terrible. I mean, Batman versus Superman had an amazing opening weekend and then completely fell in the tank. So... That that's where the real test is going to be. I'm not surprised at all that it's tracking huge. One thing I want to say too is when you look at some of these um, franchise movies, the tracking numbers are often low. Mm -hmm. uh, in Civil War, Deadpool, and Black Panther, they all tracked low and then ended up, ended up beating that mark um, by quite a bit. I think what this shows is that the casual fan is probably much different than me, much different than you, much different than than our audience probably. Where there is a lot of there are a lot of people who are interested in this movie. There are a lot of people who were yearning for this movie, or maybe when they saw it, realized that they really wanted to see it, even if they didn't realize that in the first place. Hardcore fans might not care, but I think like casual fans really, really do. Well, and I think the three examples you brought up were also movies that were very well reviewed. Yeah, which Solo hasn't been reviewed yet. So if it gets really good reviews, I expect those numbers to go way up because that'll attract more people. And if it gets shelled in its reviews, it'll go way down. Would be my guess. Yep. Now, if this movie's a success, what other movies do you think? Would kind of you know this is very much a nostalgia movie, right? Sure. Um, do you think other ones will get greenlit? Do you think Obi Wan gets greenlit? What other movies might come down the pike? I think Obi Wan's probably already greenlit, sure. just not announced. I I think the bigger thing will be if this is a hit, we're going to see this become its own trilogy and have multiple follow ups. And if it's not, then they'll cut bait and they'll go somewhere else we already know that the majority of the cast is signed to three picture deals which i think is just standard operating procedure now for these type of movies but i think that's more what what we're banking on because there's always going to be characters that they're going to pull and make movies around it's just whether this movie can make us invested enough in these characters to want to see them two three more times right. Um, you mentioned Rogue One. This is a bit of an aside, but what did your kids think of Rogue One? Did your kids see it, and did they like it? My daughter has not seen it because she doesn't have a massive Star Wars affinity. She likes a little bit of Clone Wars because she likes Ahsoka, and then she likes Last Jedi because she likes the Porgs. True. Um, and all we do is fast forward to the Porgs when she watches it. <laughs> so it's it's a you would love that version actually. It's you know it's a brisk ten minutes or so. <laughs> But my my son liked Rogue One a lot. He saw it in the theater, and we've seen it at home. And he basically, though, wants to watch the final third, mm -hmm. the the giant battle going on at the end. So he will he will generally ask me if we can just start there and watch that, which I never have a problem with. Uh, but as much as he likes any Star Wars movie, he likes that. Well, he likes Return of the Jedi the best, mm -hmm. um, which again is mostly because it's just bookended by great battles. But uh, he, he enjoyed Rogue One as much as he enjoys any of the other Star True. Wars movies. It's not too long for him. Uh, what about Boom? She likes Rogue One a lot. She really likes Jyn Erso. Mm -hmm. I think having the main character be a female has really drawn her to, to both that movie and um, the new trilogy. I mean, those are really her jam. But she's really kind of a prequel girl. Oh, okay. She really, like... You know, we don't have those on on demand now. We have those on old DVDs, and so sure. I'll watch the the or not on demand, but like on digital versions. And so I watch the digital versions all the time, and she's always asking, "Can we get the one with Darth Maul? Can we get the oh. one with Jar Jar? Can we get the one with with uh, with uh, Padme as is like her gal?" So that's kind of like the forbidden fruit for her because she doesn't uh. see it as much, and so um, that's really what she's into. But she did she did really like Rogue One. Nice. nice. So, uh, real quick, The Observer recently asked us... Now, I don't want us to go and talk about the article too much, but I think they asked an interesting question. And they asked if Marvel is the Star Wars of this generation, with franchises like Harry Potter, the MCU, the DCEU, and the Paddington series, there's no shortage to choose from. Luke, is Marvel the Star Wars of this generation? Is Star Wars the Star Wars of this generation? And what is better? And is that better? Better just for you? Or is it better, better overall? 
This is a cop out answer, but I think it's a stupid question. Oh, that poised hurts. by observer, not oh, poised thanks, by you. <laughs> no, I mean, why do why does anything have to be the something of another generation? Yeah. Mar- Marvel's its own thing. What they've done is unique that we haven't seen before. So it's it's the first of its kind, and that's how we should look at it. I don't think we need to go in the terms of what's it's comparable from another time period or another generation. I personally have enjoyed the Star Wars movies more than the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Part of that might be to do that there's just less of them. So the anticipation for Star Wars movies for me is more, there is some of that nostalgia from when I was a kid. I wasn't someone who read those type of Marvel comics growing up. I read X-Men. So for me, uh, there's just too many of the Marvel movies for me to to go overboard and, and like it that much because I think it, it is a little watered down for me. I watched Doctor Strange again the other day, which I thought do in my mean head... Iron Man 4? <laughs> what? I do you mean yeah. Iron Man 4? <laughs> yeah, well, and that's the thing is that, that I thought about halfway through it is if I hadn't seen all these other Marvel movies, I'd probably think this was mind-blowing and amazing, but it just ends up being another one of what you've kind of already seen. So I, I end up not loving them as much because it, it starts to feel a little repetitive. They are doing some good things with taking them in different di- directions. Like Guardians of the Galaxy was a big departure. Thor Ragnarok. You know, I go a little back and forth on that. I enjoyed it, but it just felt like they went, well, we'll make Thor Guardians of the Galaxy. So yeah. I didn't see it quite as a departure. Like, I saw Guardians of the Galaxy at the time it came out to me was a complete departure from everything sure. else that they were doing. And while I enjoyed Ragnarok, it didn't feel like a departure. That might be part of the reason that I like Ant-Man more than most people. Because it felt completely different. Like, I'm not going to say it's the best one by far or anything like not, that. Right. Oh, no. But they were doing something different. I liked that it was a heist movie. I liked that they really realized how dumb a premise that character kind of is and were fine to, to call it out. Again, he was just fighting himself at the end, like most Marvel movies. But there's just too many of them. So I've enjoyed more of the, the Star Wars as far as big franchises go. But there aren't a lot of... Those are the two big franchises and X-Men that I really follow. Like, I didn't get into the Harry Potter movies. I'm not a big Jurassic World, Jurassic Park guy other than the first Jurassic Park. I I like horror movies a lot, and I like trying to find, you know, indie movies and stuff when I can. So of the big franchises, you know, I don't like Transformers, but I don't know anyone else that does like Transformers movies. I tend to pretty much stay with Star Wars, Marvel, and X-Men, and even the X-Men ones I see more out of loyalty to the brand because 50% of the time they're terrible and 50% of the time they're good, so. I was I was going to ask you, and I was going to say this at the end, but I don't want to forget and I don't have a pen with me to write it down. Do you get more excited for X-Men movies or do you get more excited when Marvel movies are coming out? When you're going to the theater, what, do you, what gets you going? I get more excited for X-Men movies because... That's what I grew up on, and there's a, there's a lot more in X-Men movies of the possibility of seeing something that was thrown in there for people like me who read the comics growing up, where I can go, oh yeah, I know that, I know that. I mean, there's a little of that in Marvel, be, because there were crossover events, and I was aware of what was going on in some of those comics and storylines. Like, you know, I knew the main bullet points of the comic Infinity War, you know, going into this, so I, I knew some of the things they were referencing that were going on, but there's just more of that in X-Men. So mm-hmm. I get more excited to kind of see those characters that I loved a lot more pop up or maybe get shout outs to or, or, you know, call outs. I remember there was one point, cause I love multiple man was one of my favorite characters. <laughs> that is your guy. Yeah. yeah I love Mandrake. multiple He's man. Awesome. And there was in, and strong guy. Don't forget strong. Guy. I do. Yeah, love, I love strong guy too. And I remember there was in X2 X United. There's a point where mystique is busting in and she's trying to pull up a list to find out where Magneto is and they kind of have a list of mutants and Multiple Man's name, Jamie Madrox, is on that list. And I remember in the theater being like, oh, it's Multiple Man's on there. And it was just a name on a list. But I got all excited for it. And that that's not going to happen to me generally in Marvel movies. But if you had, had to put it down, I mean, Marvel movies have a much higher win percentage as far as being good movies than X-Men movies. True. Even though I think when X-Men movies are good, they're really, really good. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, X-Men First Class is a movie that you and I both really like. We both like Days of Future Past, even though we were both expecting that movie to be garbage. Yeah, I thought it would be terrible. And then we both came out of the theater very excited about that. And uh, Apocalypse 
drained all of the energy from the those two. And then we got back with Logan. Logan was yeah. obviously a good and movie. X two is one of my favorite comic yeah. book movies of all time. I I watched it again recently, and I still love it. Really it. Holds and, up. Yeah. It really, it's really good. Uh, in my opinion, you're right. This is a stupid question. But for the sake of the argument in the show, I'm going to answer it. I think um, Marvel's better than Star Wars for me. And you mentioned that my feelings about that was with Star Wars last week where I put Marvel slightly ahead. And the reason why is because of the longevity, the many movies where I actually think that's a bonus. And sort of the meticulous planning and the dropping of things where it all threads together. Um, it's It's the same for me. As two shows that I really liked, X Men or um, X Files and Lost, um, where I think that like Marvel took what Star Wars did and made it better, and I think Lost took what the X Files did and made it better. That being said, I enjoyed two out of the three Star Wars movies. While I say that Marvel is better for me right now, I don't think that's a done deal. I mean, Star Wars was a much bigger deal to me as a kid than Marvel was. I didn't even really like Marvel until Captain America: Winter Soldier. That's when it, everything flipped for me, and I became obsessed with it. So. You know, we'll see in five years. I mean, the Han Solo movie, man, that's got me in the nostalgic feels. I mean, the the feeling that you get from, like, Marvel movies, or, I'm sorry, from, from X-Men movies is kind of, I think, where I might be headed with this Han Solo movie. Like, it's it's getting me, like, super stoked. Um, just because when I was a kid, I know, I know I like Luke now more. When I was a kid, Han Solo was my dude. He was much cooler. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just... We'll see. Ask me again sometime. <laughs> you got a month. Less than a month. All right. Let's talk about the uh, the emails we got. Guess who's back? Back again. It's Pat. Pat from KC. And hey. he writes, that Deadpool video was straight funny. Now, he's talking about the first one we did, not the one that came out this week from uh, the Maya and Luke oh, okay. trailer. Um, but here's the question. He was arguing with his friend, is Star Wars fantasy or is it sci-fi? He believes it's fantasy. What does Luke think? Oh, well, that's a good question, and it's not one I have really had thought about. But a, about a month ago, or maybe two months ago, I was listening to a podcast that was talking about the best female science fiction characters of all time. And they didn't include anyone from Star Wars, but Leia specifically, because they deemed her as fantasy, and that blew my mind. It had never occurred to me to think of it as anything other than science fiction. I mean, there's obviously some mysticism to it with the Force, even though we know the Force really is scientifically blood parasites. But <laughs> I always, I mean, they're in spaceships. It's There's a lot of technology. I always thought of it as science fiction. It never really occurred to me to think of it as a fantasy. For me, when I think fantasy, I think Lord of the Rings, dragons, Game of Thrones... That's where my mind goes when I hear the word fantasy, not not to spaceships and laser blasts. Sure. Uh, my dad first referred to it as sci-fi when I was a kid, and so my heart wants it to be sci-fi and wants it to be right. So he said before, and I don't know if I've ever told you about his and my RFK bet, so this was before that when I believed everything he said. <laughs> I think by a strict definition, it's not science fiction. But I think most of the people who really push this are Star Trek people who get pissed off at Star Wars. That's everybody that I've ever had this argument with, including a teacher in the, my junior year in high school, was a Star Trek fan just trying to rip on Star Wars. So, no. Pat, you can think it's fantasy. You can think it's sci-fi. I think you're probably right either way. I tend to think of it as sci-fi. It sounds like Luke does as well, but I think you're well... Well, there's no wrong answer. There's it's... no wrong answer. So whatever your friend says... Just tell them that the boys from Kid Seriously said that Pat was right. Yeah, we agree with you if if it comes down to it. Yeah, just just <laughs> throw that. Just say that you're right because somebody on the internet told you you were. Hey, you at home or on the road or in the car or at the bar, what are you doing right now? Why don't you send an email to kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com and ask us a question so we can read it on this here very show. And if you're listening via YouTube, give that subscribe button a smash and help us take it to the unlucky number of 13. Let's talk about the Clone Wars. Season 1, episode 14, Defenders of Peace. When surrounded by war, one must eventually choose a side. Blue text that actually fits the episode. hey yo.
Got a couple of newcomers to this one. Bill Canterbury is the writer, and the director is Stuart Lee. And we continue with the story from last week about what it means to be a pacifist, a lemur, and a lerman. Just as we thought we had this peace thing figured out, the separatists bring the war to our friends, and we're forced to look deeper into the same themes we had uh, last week. Luke, help us through it. So we open on Meridon, which is where the Lerman live, who are the lemur-like characters we met last episode. They are pacifists. They moved there to escape the war, and they want no violence, and they want to take no side. They tried to expel the Jedi in the last episode because they believe they caused the war as much as the separatists. As a quick aside, do you wish they were like a little bit more hippie-ish? Like, I find myself wishing that they were totally, like, like, like California surfer dude type aliens instead of, like, some cross. I don't know. They became Every... really Scottish in this episode. Yeah, it was, it was really Scottish. It went, like, went from, like, kind of Scottish to... Full Scottish. Full. It was up to 11. So, I don't know. That I, I kind of wish if I could, if they could do it all over again and I was giving notes, I'd be like, these guys gotta be surfer dudes from California. Yeah, Keanu Reeves. Right. Would have been the model to go with. So, Whoa. so yeah, we're there with the Lerman and the Jedi, which is three Jedi. It is Anakin, it is Ahsoka, and it is the Jedi we met in the last one, which is um, Ayala Sakura. And then I think we have two clones. Our clones kind of fl- uh, fluctuate as to how many we have, but one is Rex. So an important clone and maybe That's some cool, fodder, cool. maybe not. And Anakin is hurt much worse than we left him in the last episode. He was hurt badly in that, but he seemed to recover at the end. And when we see him here, he could barely move, barely do anything. So he is kind of out of the picture, and they are stuck on this planet. And they don't know how they're going to get off, but the Separatists do not know they're there. So they are very surprised when a Separatist battle cruiser lands. So they see it. And they kind of decide that's our only way off of this planet is we got to steal a ship from them. Now the Separatists come down and that is Lock Dord, who is a new character that is leading them, who is voiced by the excellent George Takai, which was kind of a fun, fun little bit when, when he came out. I didn't realize that. Yeah, that's George Takai. And they are coming down and they go to the village to greet them as liberators and, and, Tell them how excited they are that uh, they were able to protect them and they're under separatist protection. And they want, the Lerman want nothing to do with that, especially their leader who wants nothing to do with this battle. They still don't know the Jedi are there uh, because the Jedi go into hiding to stay away from them. Now, as uh, the Jedi are leaving, they've already had some debates about the ethics of war. Ahsoka is very much not understanding where the Lerman are coming from and they're kind of is this tone of, well, you're going to have to fight eventually, just as our blue text told us. And Ahsoka, kind of dismissively as a child, doesn't agree with any of their decision-making. But the Jedi, the rest of the Jedi are willing to respect that that's their decision and are just going to move on. So they're taking off through the tall grass, where they need oxygen to breathe. And they run across an Imperial probe droid. Well, I suppose at this time it's a Separatist probe droid, who notices them, they chase after it, destroy it so i think that might have just been a time waste because it didn't really play into anything and we cut back to the separatists who they the jedi are now able to see and we have one of our favoriteest things to ever occur in star wars a new super weapon that can do something amazing now let me just say the first so we're at the 10 minute mark roughly we're, we're coming up on almost halfway through we're nothing i was super bored for the first 10 minutes and then the new super weapon. And I'm like, you gotta be killing me. And the reason that I was kind of pissed off at this episode was you have these pacifists. And in the first episode, they are talking about their beliefs. And it's like really cool. It's it's my second favorite episode about these people who are sticking to their guns and they want no place. And it kind of shows the Jedi or are, are, calls them on their bullshit, which you and I have talked about how much we like. And now it just unravels. Now you can't be a pacifist because this war is coming for you. It's like, no, if you hadn't shown up and the Separatists hadn't shown up, these people would be fine. And it seems like the theme was heading towards, like, if you're a pacifist, you're just a big pansy. And you need to fight. Because if you don't fight, then we don't have a show. And the show's called Star Wars, bitches. So let's go. Well, I do think that the the Separatists went there... The Separatists don't know the Jedi are there. Right, and that, that part that. is a great coincidence that, or, and I mean great, like, a big coincidence, not like an awesome one, because I was kind of rolling my eyes. Like, oh, the Separatists just show up out of all the places in all the world, at all the times. They just show up now, right here. 
Um, but I mean, it is co- obviously that is coincidental, and you're right. always going to have that. But they do say they show up on this planet because they want to test the super weapon, and the right. power of the super weapon is that it fires off a shell that lands and explodes and spreads kind of a fire. But it doesn't affect mechanical equipment. It only affects organic material. So it would kill people. It would kill clones. It would kill trees and brush. But it doesn't kill battle droids. So they could fire this into a battle droid clone you know, fight sequence. And it would kill all the clones, but none of the battle droids. And this is when things change for me. Yeah. Because I was, like, bored, and then I was like, okay. That's a cool idea. I, that's a great idea. It's, like, the opposite of, like, an ion cannon, you know? Like yeah. The, the, it was, it's it's beautiful, and I loved it, and I, all of a sudden I kind of set up, and I was into the episode. Yeah, and they, they chose this planet because they knew the Lerman were there, and they wanted to fire it on people, basically, or uh, organic living souls, to, to test it. Dooku is there via hologram to test the weapon. Uh, George Takai wants to use his invention of this weapon to get himself promoted. And I do I do like, this is the first time that we've seen this in all of Star Wars, the Separatists are referred to as the Alliance, which is kind of what they'll end up merging into and becoming in the episodes four through six. So I thought that was nice that they kind of put that there because I do like how, as evil as the Separatists are, they end up being a lot of the roots of the good guys that you end up cheering for right. Cassian, in the main movies. Cassian was a Separatist. Yeah. So they they fire one shell off to test it just in a tree area, which the Jedi are in this giant tree, and they don't know that because they still don't know they're there. So it, it destroys everything. They narrowly escape our heroes, and then they just, the Separatists decide they're going to move forward and fire this weapon at the Lerman. And there's a really cool shot, like, we talk about the, you know, are the clones a big deal, or are the clones totally di- um, dispensable, and, and the show kind of goes back and forth, but Ayla Secura does, like, a really cool uh, move to save a clone, and, like, risks her life, which I thought was pretty cool. Yep, yep, so then the Jedi do sneak aboard and steal a, a ship from the Separatists without being noticed, really. Meanwhile, back at the Lerman village, the leader of the Lerman, his son, Wag 2, who is the only healer that we met in the last episode, really wants to go fight because they know the Separatists are coming. And way, uh, his dad refuses, saying, we can't fight. That's This is our way of life. We can't, we can't do this. And there's kind of a, if we're going to be wiped out, then that's our fate, but we're not going to sacrifice our values. Which, in my head, I went, well, yeah, but you can still run away. You did <laughs> run away to this planet. Like, still evacuate your people or something, but... That, that's a minor point. So they have a little bit of disagreement. The Jedi end up landing in the village and trying to convince them of what's coming. Now, they have stolen some shield generators from the Separatists, and they've set them up around the village. So when the Separatists go to attack and launch the shell, the shield generator protects them, which is some interesting physics, because you can walk through these shield generators. They just stop laser blasts, so I don't know why the shell was stopped from going <laughs> through the... But whatever, it's a kid's shell. Yeah, that that didn't make I didn't think about that. But what made me laugh about these things is we've seen in Phantom Menace and we've seen in this show that when the shields go up, they kind of like the slow sort of like growing shield that starts up high and kind of like makes this big like you know semicircle around the team. Um, and and that's how this starts. But then like there was like some sort of glitch because like it just wasn't working. And so then the end it's like happens really fast. Yeah. Like and and I was like wait wait and I like reminded to to watch it again. But that made me laugh. I didn't think about your point though. Yeah. So the uh, battle breaks out. They go. The Jedi start mauling through everyone and fighting. And the the droids just decide and, and the separatists just decide George Takai decide they're just going to kill everyone in the village even though they didn't get to test the super weapon the way they wanted to so they send battle droids in to just obliterate the lerman and the younger lerman led by wag 2 decide to fight back so they they fight the jedi fight the Jedi end up winning the battle. Not surprisingly, the Lermans do not get slaughtered. No, is... and they are amazing fighters for people who've never fought before. That's like, and that, I, like... I really enjoy their their mo- their movement too because they don't run; they curl into balls and roll everywhere, which I really got a kick of. I don't know why I enjoy that so much, but that's that's how they move, and they move very fast. Did you like this land battle? It was okay. I didn't think it was anything too spectacular we've seen better land battles in my opinion perhaps i mean i dug it but i think i dug it because there's a moment when anakin does something that i've never seen before and i don't know if, if you've had this or we're gonna hit this but 
he reaches out with the force and pulls um, a a droid with his telekinesis right into his his uh, lightsaber and slices it. I'd never seen that in Star Wars before, so I was like, hell yeah! So maybe that just made me like it more than it really deserved. But I well, and it's not that they planned this when they made the episode because it was a long time before Rogue One. But it's kind of like when. Vader will, you know, puts a guy mm-hmm. on the roof of the spaceship and then just lightsabers through him while he's stuck on the roof with his his telekinesis. And then as we come to an end, the, you know, the droids are taken out, everyone's saved, and th- this is what made the episode for me, because I also didn't agree I, with what we were kind of being preached at. It was kind of, oh, the Lerman are weak because they don't want to fight. But as... They're talking, the Wag 2 and his dad are talking about what happened, and the son's kind of proud about it. Wag 2, or the dad says, yeah, we have, but at what price now? And then a bunch of Republic battle cruisers come into their planet. Yeah. And they don't say anything more, that's where it cuts out. But it, it really hits you hard with the impression of, yeah, this is going to change their lives forever in ways they didn't want it to. And maybe they had to in that moment to survive, but now they've sacrificed a lot of the principles that they built their whole society upon. So that was something I was not expecting to come at the end and really turn the episode around for me. Yeah. Yeah, I think the episode started slow. The first 10 minutes were boring for me. I will say that the visuals, even though there was a change in directors, the visuals were just as good as the first episode, the first um the intro to this episode that we had last week. Um, I, for me, I rank this as number six. It's sort of in the middle. Where do you rank it? Well, and for me, it's the same thing. I give it three pews from mm-hmm. Laura Dern. So it, it was in the middle. I agree that it started. This is one in that first 10 minutes. I think I paused it like four times trying to see how far I was. Cause I, and every time I thought I was significantly farther, but then when you get to the last half, it moves yeah. very quickly. So it, it speeds up. But we've certainly seen better in the last episode that started this one was significantly better. But I would say of all the two to three part arcs we've had, this is the best complete arc. Absolutely. Because most of the arcs are a really good episode and a really bad episode. And this was a very good episode and a good pretty, episode. Yeah, a pretty good episode. I mean, I, like it's not one of my favorites, but it's it's in the top half and I and I did enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. No, it it's good. And it's it's going on what we have kind of heard and what i've had i think a little more experience with you is that how much better this show gets Mm -hmm. as it moves forward because we had some real clunkers to start out and now i'm feeling confident that we are in that space where it's going to continue to pick up i'm sure we're and every time we say that jar jar comes every time yeah which means every damn time he's probably the next episode it'll be a jar jar c3po you know, romp. slapstick comedy. <laughs> exactly, exactly. They'll Mr. Magoo themselves through some type of situation. Oh, uh, please no. But you know, now we're slapping together a few good ones in a row, so hopefully we can continue that streak. Absolutely. Let's get to other nerd news. And I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. Luke, besides Star Wars, what other nerd stuff are you into? I had to, I have, with my job, I have, I work out of my home and I travel a lot, but today I got to be home office all day and I actually didn't have a ton to do, so luckily no one's listening. So I had a lot of time to my myself and I am a person, and you would be the, the leader of this m- movement to say that I am never one that's going to be taken seriously by objectively and critically looking at music as far as my ability to understand music I think you're Have good taste and whatnot. You I, like I've never... 311 and that knocks you down. I do. Pegs, but... I do. I like being 15 and <laughs> going to concerts. But uh, I was playing some stuff on YouTube just to kind of while as background music and it randomly selects songs afterwards. So I, I started, I'm from good Minnesota boy, so I started listening to Prince and then it, it turned into uh, Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen and then I just decided to just listened to a bunch of Queen back to back to back. And I did their whole Live Aid performance from way back in the day. And I have to say is for me, I can't think of a better combination of songwriter, voice, performer, like all those things than Freddie Mercury. Like I, he just blows me away to watch and the, the range he has. I mean, I just, I, I probably spent two hours just 
not doing anything but just watching different queen stuff on there like i really really got into it when i lived out east i had some friends who were super super into queen like that really? was their jam and i i i can see in freddie mercury but i just i just never saw it i just never really could get into them and so i feel bad because like i'm sure that they're definitely like really entertaining and interesting and thought-provoking attributes to the great band queen i just can't get into them oh huh. If I want See, glam rock, I'm David Bowie and Elton John. Those are my two. Yeah, I and I just, man, I mean, you know, Bowie's another good one. I'm mean, neither of the two you mentioned are bad, but I, I think if you just when you just put all all three things together, as far as you know, the, the songs you're writing, your voice, and then you know your your presence on stage, man, man. Freddie Mercury just really does it for me. Over here, I'm getting back into baseball. I'm watching the Cubs and the L.A. Dodgers when I. Get the opportunity researching random things about Colorado's Arenado and his OPS, or who has the best whip among San Diego starting pitching. And by the way, it's rookie Joey Lucchesi. Um, and so now, at least until the World Cup starts, I'm falling in love with baseball again. Um, something that hit me hard a couple days ago is Ichiro is maybe retiring. He's taking the rest of the year off, joining the front office of the the Mariners, and may or may not come back next year. And Man, I love me some Ichiro. Like, I was thinking back to when he first came. I was I was uh, living in Albuquerque at the time, and I was watching a ton of baseball. And I was, you know, on the West Coast, where you get a lot of West Coast games. And so I watched a ton of him. And just what an unbelievable player he was, how much fun he was to watch. I can still remember in one of his first games against the A's, there was a, somebody was trying to go first to third on him. And he uh, he picked up the ball and fired it to third base. And I, and I swear the ball didn't get more than six feet high the entire time didn't bounce just hit like hit right on the base and and threw the guy out and it really like made me sad that Ichiro is is done yeah but it's been a long it has ride, been a long ride. it's been a it real has. long ride which is really impressive have you been wa- watching and now i'm blanking on his name the the guy in the angels oh yeah otani the, oh yeah otani with the yeah. pitching in hit i mean that is just mind-blowing to me it's... yeah i don't know if he's still as hot as he was when he when he first got here i think the angels have cooled off boston went into town and kind of slapped them backhanded them and kind of cooled them off a little bit but yeah otani is the amount of time that it takes to be a really good pitcher and the amount of time that it takes to be a really good hitter i i don't know how people could actually do both and yeah. he's proving, you know, and, and granted there's going to be, as soon as pitchers figure him out, he's going to have holes in his game and he'll have to work through that just like any player. But what he's doing right now is phenomenal. Well, and the same with batters. Right, right, right. right. You know, th- that's just kind of the way it goes. But the whole prospect of him doing both things is just awesome to me and fascinating. And I, you know, I'm one of those guys who always got a thrill out of Mike friggin' Hampton, you know, just because he could hit a home run every now and again when he'd get his stray at bat. So to think of a guy in the American League where no other pitcher ever, ever even takes a swing to be doing even this well for this short of a time, I think it's fascinating. I think it's good for baseball too. I, I, obviously as a Dodger fan, um, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the angels, but I, I don't, there's not a rival. Like I hate the white Sox. Like I freaking hate the white Sox. Cause I, I grew up a Cubs fan. And when I was younger, I moved out to California, but I watched a lot of angels baseball. So there's not the animosity there, but man, I sure wish he was on a team that I liked better because he's so much fun. He'd probably be my favorite player right now. But Tony is amazing. Yeah, and I wonder, you know, I mean, you could say this about a, a ton of different players, but even though they're a major market team, the Angels get about the least amount of attention of any major market team in baseball. So if if he was on the White Sox, if he was on the Cubs, if he was on the Mets, if he was on any of these other teams that get more attention, we'd probably be hearing three times as much about him. But the Angels are just one of those teams that, you know, you, know, you might as well be a Mariner or, a, you know, a a minor leaguer in Canada for all the attention you're going to get nationally. Which is, I mean, which is a shame because like Trout is the best. I mean, everybody likes Harper, but Trout is the best player by far in the league. Everything that he can do and they deserve to have more publicity. And I think they're going to have an awesome year this year and they'll make some noise in the playoffs and you know, that'll be good. Yeah. I mean, they just, they're just going to have to, I mean, there's wild card spots, but they have Houston in their division. So that makes it a little, yeah, I mean, little trickier. They're, they're, they're two of the best four teams in, in the AL, in my opinion. I mean, you know, I'm thinking about the AL Central. I don't know how 
offhand how good the the Cleveland ball club is, but between Boston, New York, I think is gonna play better, and whoever comes out of the Central. But I mean, the Angels and the the Astros they're gonna be they're gonna be fine. Yeah. They're gonna be fine, and they'll they'll make some noise. Only four billion more games until we find out. There we go. <laughs> well, uh, speaking, of our four billion is at an end for tonight. Luke, the children, they reach out to you, they call in the night, and they say, "How can we find you?" How can they find you, Luke? I am on Twitter, Luke underscore Nitzel, at Luke underscore Nitzel. And together, we are at Kid Seriously on Twitter. I like how you assumed I was going to forget about that. I was actually not. Well, we both time. forgot about it for about 12 or 13 weeks. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> at Kid Seriously is where we actually are together. But me, I'm at Maya Madrid. You can find me on Twitter there. Um, sometimes on you can find at our website, kidseriously.wordpress.com. Dot com, which will get more content now that a lot of our lives are starting to settle down. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. Hit that dislike button. I don't give a shit. We'll see you later. Bye. <laughs>